Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to proceed with the next session. Uh, my name is Qadir Al Khalifa. I am a dietitian specialized in diabetes education and diabetes care. Uh, I have 10 years work experience working in the field of diabetes. Uh, I am part of the diabetes multidisciplinary team at Amiri Hospital. I'm also a Daphne and Wicked educator at Disman Diabetes Institute. And hopefully I can be informative today uh, regarding uh, medical nutrition therapy for diabetes. And uh, if you have any questions, you can ask them throughout the presentation or you can keep them at the end, whatever you're comfortable with. Okay, so diabetes. Diabetes is considered a relatively new term. Uh, it was first introduced in the 1980s as a blend of the words diabetes and obesity. And it basically covers the adverse health effects of both diabetes and obesity. It gained popularity in 2010 with the rise of diabetes and obesity and with the diabetes, diabetes epidemic. Medical nutrition therapy plays a big role in both diabetes and obesity. So as you can imagine, it is very vital and some might consider it the first line therapy when it comes to diabetes and obesity. So the goal of medical nutrition therapy is to promote healthful eating patterns, emphasizing a variety of nutrition dense foods, as well as improve overall health and achieve and maintain normal body weight. It also plays a role in glycemic, blood pressure, and lipid control, and it helps prevent and delay complications of diabetes and other non-communicable diseases, and to maintain the pleasure of eating. As human beings, we love food, and that's very normal. All our social gatherings are centered around food. So developing a bad relationship with food can also have adverse health effects. Part of nutrition therapy and part of diabetes management is behavioral therapy. A lot of people have developed an unhealthy relationship with food, especially since uh, nowadays there's a lot of talk about considering obesity as an eating disorder, a type of binge eating disorder. So it's important that when we give nutrition advice to any patient, it's important that we maintain that pleasure of eating. The, it, it's important that they can still enjoy the food that they like to eat, but at the same time try to limit the quantities so that they can, we can still achieve our end targets. Nutrition has been around for thousands of years, and nutrition education in regards to diabetes and obesity has been around for thousands of years since ancient Egypt. So I'm gonna walk you through the, the evolution of the diabetic diet uh, until we reach our current guidelines. So I think when you understand the history of the diabetes diet, of where we started and how far we've come, it helps us understand our current guidelines and, understand and appreciate them even more. So um, there's been a long history of diabetes treatment. Uh, the, first, uh, the first mention of diabetes has been since 1500 BC in the Eberus Papyrus, uh, which is an ancient Egypt journal, uh, ancient Egyptian journal. Um, it first mentioned diabetes as a concept of too great of emptying of sugar in the urine. So during that time, it was believed that diabetes was a deficiency of blood sugar. So because there was excess urine in the blood, so a diet high in carbohydrates was prescribed for people with diabetes, uh, same as we would say in, in this day and age. So if a person has iron deficiency, they, we would just prescribe a diet high in iron. But with diabetes, because they were prescribing a diet high in sugar, that also led to more and more uh, sugar in the urine. So as you can imagine, in the olden days, people with diabetes didn't live long. And this continued up until the 18th century when a Scottish physician, Dr. John Rollo, he argued that carbohydrate restriction could help reduce glucosuria. So he was an army physician, and he tried with one of his patients, uh, Captain Meredith, uh, he, he put him on a strict meat diet. And when he put him on a strict meat diet, he noticed there was an improvement in his health. And that's when the whole concept of a low carb or a carb restricted diet got introduced as management for diabetes. Uh, the diet was mainly um, milk, um, water and limes, and um, meats and fats. So there was very little carbs and he noticed that there was an improvement in his medical condition. And um, 
This diet continued on until the 19th century, and it worked better with adults. There was an improvement with adults. Previously, um, people didn't live very long when they were diagnosed with diabetes, but with this kind of diet, they lived for a couple of more years, but it didn't work well with children. Children only lasted or only survived a couple of months on this type of diet. And then we are introduced to Dr. Elliot Joslin. You might know him as the founder of Joslin Diabetes Institute, which is one of the uh, biggest diabetes centers in the world. So jo Dr. Joslin's mother was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And um, through a series of a combination of meal planning, exercise, and food management, he helped her live for 10 years. Previously, the estimated survival age for diabetes was just one year. So if you're diagnosed, you live up to one year. So the fact that he helped her live for 10 years was a huge accomplishment. And that was mainly through diet and exercise. And that's when nutrition and exercise was introduced as a major component in diabetes management. And then in 1922, insulin was discovered, and that also got added to the diabetes triad, which is a combination of diet, exercise, and insulin. And that's what we know today, and that's what we're basing all our information on today and living off of. Um, in 1939, the first idea or the first concept of carbohydrate counting or the exchange system was introduced. It was a very complicated system and it was, it's been refined since then to be more simplistic and to be easily applicable to this day and age. But back then, um, they found out that, okay, carbs increases blood sugar, whereas protein and fat, they don't have a direct effect on blood sugar. So they were divided into a line system and it was called, um, it was called the line ration diet. So uh, foods were described as or um, and put into two line categories. Black lines would represent carbs and then red lines would represent proteins and fats. And um, it was advised that a patient eat the same, amount of uh, the same amount of calories or the same amount of food every day, but they were given charts so that they can switch their foods out as long as they maintained the same quantity every single day. As I said, it was pretty confusing, but it did work. The only issue with it was that all people with diabetes were given the same diet. So anyone with diabetes that was overweight or obese were given a diet that was 100 grams of carbs and 1,000 calories. Maybe that was the first step or first introduction to a very low, carb, uh, very low calorie diet, which we'll talk more about later. Uh, but during that time, it was considered very, very little. But then when a person lost weight and achieved their um, normal weight, and then food can increase to 150 grams of carbs and uh, 1,700 calories. Just for context, one cup of rice is about 45 grams of carbs. So when we uh, prescribe 100 grams of carbs per day, it might not be too little. So it seems enough. <laughs> Doctor is looking at me like, oh no. <laughs> Okay, no, it, it might not be too little. So if you're going to distribute 100 grams throughout the day, so for lunch, a cup of rice, and then for breakfast, some toast, and then for dinner, again, you can add some carbs. So it can be easily distributed. But the problem is the calories. We're, they were only given 1,000 calories per day. So that also meant very little protein and very little fat. And then we go into the food pyramid. Um, so... The issue with the food pyramid was that politics started getting involved in the health system and started getting involved with nutrition guidelines. So um, the USDA released the basic seven guides, uh, but the issue with it was it mostly focused on uh, food rationing to help cope with food shortages during the war. So uh, it was recommended that, uh, so the food pyramid was very similar to what you see here, very similar to what you see here, where there weren't any servings indicated, but it just was uh, recommended that you eat more of the bottom two layers and less of the top two layers. And the bottom two layers consists of carbs, consists of fruits, and consists of vegetables. So for a person with diabetes, telling them to eat as much carbs and as much fruit as you want, that's not really gonna help with his blood sugar. And then you're telling them to eat less proteins and eat less fats. And during that time, there was also um, there, there was also a lot of emphasis on heart disease. Uh, there was uh, the the 
uh, the diet heart hypothesis had been initiated where people were focusing a lot of, on heart disease and less on other uh, medical issues like diabetes and obesity. And um, uh, it was, uh, people uh, started to realize that a diet low in saturated fat and a diet low uh, uh, can, help reduce, uh, can help reduce cholesterol and heart disease. So that was their main focus, just eat less fats. But there are good fats. There are uh, unsaturated fats that the body needs. So they didn't really take into account the, requir the requirements. They just said, eat fats sparingly, and that was it. And that was their, that was their, way, <clears throat> that was their way of trying to help with the weight management uh, rather than help with the, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead, doctor. Yes, exactly, yes. Because you're focusing more on carbs and fruits, and fruits are also considered carbohydrates, so it didn't really help with diabetes. And then 10 years later, that's when um, the first kind of major breakthrough uh, or major guidelines uh, appeared when it came to diabetes management because um, the first policy stated that um, uh, there is no such thing as a diabetic diet. It was more focused on healthy eating. So it focused more on uh, limiting fats, increasing complex carbohydrates and dietary fiber, and uh, uh, reducing intakes of unsaturated fats, and focused more on weight loss and diabetes management. And also during that time when uh, the, the healthy eating guidelines were published, um, it also started initiating nutrition recommendations based on weight requirements rather than just a general requirements for everyone. So uh, carbs were based on 50 to 55 uh, percent of a person's recommended daily allowance. Fats were based 30 to 35 and proteins 10 to 15 percent of a person's daily allowance. Um, and then moving on 10 years later, my plate replaced my pyramid. So they realized my period wasn't working, it didn't really help with diabetes, so they replaced it with my plate. Again, the problem with my, my plate is it's very carb dense. So you have the protein, you have the, the fruits and the grains and the dairy all in one meal, and all of these are considered carbohydrates. So the meal was very carb dense. And there wasn't an there wasn't a component to introduce exercise. So the USDA, uh, the, U, uh, the CDC and the ADA, um, they worked together to come up with a diabetes friendly version of my plate, which is called my plate diabetes. And, um, um, what they did was half the plate would be centered on non-starchy vegetables. So uh, starchy vegetables would be considered potato, corn, peas. Those were all part of the carbs group. And, and rather than using the word grains, they substituted that with the word carbs food. So even fruits and starchy vegetables and grains were all included as part of the carbs food. So having this distribution helped uh, maintain a lower body weight and also helped reduce the amount of carb uh, eaten because uh, with the starchy vegetables, they're high in fiber, so they helped maintain glycemic control as well as helped with satiety. So even by reducing the amount of food we eat, because we're eating more fiber, so that helps increase satiety. It's also focused on water and zero calorie drinks, so in decreasing the consumption of high sweetened beverages so that's also uh, that was also one of the recommendations so this whole journey brings us to today's current guidelines so we follow the ADA standard of medical care guidelines so the latest guidelines were published in 2002 and with the latest guidelines there is a chapter on obesity and weight management for the treatment of type 2 diabetes and the guidelines state that there is no ideal macronutrient pattern for people with diabetes Meal plans should be individualized while keeping total calories and metabolic goals in mind. So what does that mean? What it means is that we don't need a set distribution of the amounts of carbs, protein, fats that we need to eat. What it means is that we should individualize each meal plan to suit the patient's metabolic condition, to suit their, li to suit their lifestyle, to suit their eating behavior, and to suit their food preferences. Um, so in the consensus report, uh, in a meta-analysis that evaluated all uh, major uh, dietary advice, um, it broke down the different types of diet recommendations and their effect on A1C, weight, LDL, HDL, triglycerides, and CVD effect. So what the ADA is basically saying is find the right diet to fit your patient and follow that. 
So there isn't one there isn't a one-size-fits-all. So you can tailor your diet to see based on the patient's preference. So for example, if a patient comes and they say that they don't like vegetables, anything green, they won't eat it. So giving them a vegetarian diet won't really help because they're not going to adhere to it. But say, if they're willing to follow a low-carb diet, then that can help with weight management, reduction in A1C, and a reduction in triglyceride level. So we can, we can work together with the patient to figure out what works best for them based on their food preference and based on their eating behavior. As we said, we're trying to establish a better relationship with food. We don't want to scare the patient away. Whenever a patient is referred to a dietitian, the first thing they come and they say when they sit in the clinic, I don't want to stop eating this or I don't want to stop eating that or I eat chocolate every day. I don't want to stop. So it's not about forcing them to do anything they're not comfortable with, but it's about gradually introducing healthy eating eating behavior or trying to come up with a compromise where they can still enjoy the foods they like, but at the same time maintain good health. <clears throat> so based on current ADA recommendations, they recommend the, the medical nutrition therapy triad, which is a combination of nutrition, physical activity, and behavioral therapy. Behavioral therapy has become very important in part of any medical treatment because um, psychology plays a big role in any part of our, of our treatment plan. So I won't be talking much about uh, behavioral therapy. I'm going to leave that to the experts, but I'll focus on nutrition and physical activity. So in regards to nutrition, uh, a diet def an energy deficit of 500 to 700 calories per day can help with weight loss, uh, as well as high frequency counseling. So it's recommended that for a, pa a patient should have at least 16 sessions in six months. That would equate to about two to four sessions per month. So seeing a patient weekly or bi-monthly can help them achieve or can help them stay motivated and can help them also um, know that they have the support of the healthcare team. <clears throat> in recent and in, in the last and the most recent ADA recommendations, um, an introduction of the of a short-term dietary intervention was added, which is the very low calorie diet. Uh, this has gained a lot of popularity since the publication of the direct trial, uh, which was published in uh, February of 2018. So the trial was the biggest trial in diabetes remission, and it introduced the concept of following a low-calorie diet uh, as a part of weight loss and diabetes management and also establishing a long-term healthcare plan with the patient so that we can maintain weight loss and weight maintenance after that. So let's talk more about the direct study. So the concept of the direct trial came uh, with the from bariatric surgery. So the idea was that uh, they noticed that people after bariatric surgery had stopped taking their uh, diabetes medication, had lost a lot of weight, and that was mainly due to the diet followed post-bariatric surgery. The majority of weight loss post-surgery would happen during the first two to three months after surgery, and that was because of the kind of diet they were following. So the clear fluids, and then the fluid, and the transition to the, so the pureed and the soft, and then the slow reintroduction of food, that helped weight loss. And that helped people that had diabetes previously, post-bariatric surgery, go into remission. So they wanted to replicate that without the invasiveness of surgery, and that's where the direct study uh, took place. So it was divided into three phases. So with phase one, um, so patients were given total diet replacement. They were given nutritionally complete formula that had all major components of uh, vitamins, minerals, and macronutrients, and they would and they would stick to that for up to three months. So it was like a shake. They add it with they powdered shake. So they'd mix it with water and they'd drink it, and that was all they had to eat. And it was around 800 calories per day. And um, and they were advised to maintain their normal physical activity and stop any anti-diabetic and anti-hypertensive medication. And then in phase two, after the three months. Um, Food was slowly reintroduced. Every two to eight weeks, 400 calories would be introduced back into the diet. And then the last phase was just a maintenance phase, just to follow up to make sure that uh, weight loss has been maintained. So what did the results show? So these, this, these are the results of the weight changes over the 
12 months of the study. So results showed that during the first three months of the study, during the phase one, when patients were only consuming 800 calories, there was an average weight loss about, of about 15 kilos. And then when food was gradually reintroduced, there was a slight weight increase. What this showed was that at least half of the participants achieved diabetes remission with that great weight loss during the first three months. So the more weight that was lost, the higher chance of remission. Okay, so w regarding with the study, so the criteria, the inclusion criteria is um, it, w it worked better for people that were newly diagnosed within six, to w six months to one year. So for people that had diabetes for over 20 years, this might not be applicable, but this is a great way for people who are newly diagnosed, who are young, who want, who have their whole lives ahead of them, who are willing to maybe just for three months try as best as they can to follow a strict diet and then live the rest of their life more comfortably. Um, but it showed that the more weight loss or the, the people who had the highest amount of weight loss, who, who lost more than 10 kilos of weight, achieved at least 73, they had a 73% chance of getting type 2 diabetes remission. Um, this study took the world by storm. So it, it showed that, okay, we can achieve remission, but I understand it's not easy. And I personally have tried this with a couple of my patients. So imagine telling someone you can't eat. All you can do is drink these shakes for three months and diabetes will go away. How do you think people will, will accept it? Some people would. Some people would say, okay, okay, I don't mind. Three months, I can do this, and then diabetes would go away. But some people would say, okay, but or, you know, we have family gatherings, or I have to go out, so what am I going to eat during that time? So I personally noticed that during COVID or during the lockdown, when people didn't have those social obligations, they were more likely to stick to this type of diet. But with every day, going to work in the morning and, and the gathering with their colleagues and having breakfast and ordering fatayr, it was hard for them to, to stick to this type of diet. But it does work and it's not magic. It does require a lot of hard work, but it does get amazing results. Exercise guidelines. So we talked about nutrition, now we're going to talk about exercise. So current exercise guidelines, based on the ADA and CDC recommendations, they recommend 150 minutes or more of moderate to, visit, uh, to vigorous intensity aerobic activity per week, as well as at least two to three sessions of resistance training. So we need cardio and we need strength training, a combination of both. Um, guidelines differ based on age, so for um, adolescents or children, um, it's advised that they do 60 minutes of exercise daily. Uh, for adults, 150 minutes. And then for older adults, uh, it's strength training and cardio, as well as uh, some balance exercises. So either yoga or tai chi, or simple things like standing on one leg, uh, just to help uh, reduce risks, uh, fall risks and to help improve balance. So why, are we, why, is, why is a recommendation of cardio and strength? Why are we recommending both? So cardio burns more calories per session. So if we're doing a session of cardio, so if we're walking on the treadmill or we're running or on the bicycle, the amount of calories we burn during that time are great. But with weight training, it helps you burn more over time. So the amount, so it increases your basal metabolic rate. So even when you're not exercising, during the rest of the day, your body keeps burning. So a combination of both has found to have the best results. Um, in a study that examines uh, the, um, the impact of resistance training uh, in women, uh, so they followed women uh, through a period of six weeks after giving them a, um, an intensive uh, uh, resistance training program, and results showed that there was an improvement of, or there was an increase of about 250 calories uh, in their basic basal metabolic rate. So they burnt 250 calories more throughout the day. So imagine that throughout the week, that can really help with weight loss. And then um, in another study on the effect of aerobic exercise, resistance, and a combined on glucose control, um, so participants were divided into four groups, aerobic resistance and combined training, and the control. So results showed that all the exercise groups 
uh, there was a reduction in A1C. Uh, in the aerobic group had a 1.33% reduction, and the resistance group had a 0.5% reduction in A1C. However, with the combined training, there was a 1.74% reduction in their A1C. So having a, co a, combine, a combination between cardio and strength achieved the, the most results when it, when it came to weight and when it came to uh, A1C results. In conclusion, to summarize all of that, so uh, we know that in 1822, Dr. Joslin, he recommended the diabetes triad, which was a combination of nutrition, medication, and exercise. And then uh, based on the current ADA recommendations, they recommend the medical nutrition therapy triad, which is the nutrition, physical activity, and behavioral therapy. What I would like to recommend today is a combination of all of that, which I'll call the uh, diabetes cube which is nutrition, physical activity, medication, as well as behavioral therapy. So working together as a team, working as part of a multidisciplinary team, so the dietitian, uh, the physician, the nurse educator, as well as the psychologist. So having a healthcare team working together uh, for, uh, can yield the best results when it comes to patient care. Okay? These are my references, and thank you very much.